It's a uh, auto assembly plant city in central Canada. Uh, and it seems to me that it's now near total collapse um, is, is far better described as a failure to utilize, reassign, and reinvest, reinvest the human skill and knowledge capacities of the auto manufacturing workforce than it is by some disembodied notion of overcapacity or possibly even ecological obsolescence. In all of this, uh, where is workplace learning research in these debates? As it always does, it makes sense to look back briefly at where we've come from. In terms of the West, and there probably is a, a Euro-American, maybe an Anglo-American slant to some of this. I'll be corrected on it later by handing up shirt. Um, it is relatively easy, actually, to argue uh, an interest in recognizing the importance of work-related skill, knowledge, and learning has deep historical roots indeed. Uh, we could go as far back as the Middle Ages, in fact. We could go to the dual institutional forces of the monasteries, who instituted a unique perspective, actually, on the labor process, which included learning. We could also go back to the European Guild system, which developed several different approaches to the labor process as well, but slightly less ambitiously in the historical sense. Um, we can, at the very least, look to the 18th and 19th century writings of the original Western interpreters of early capitalism. Matters of the relation between economy, work, skill, and efficiency were on the tongues of people as diverse as Francis Bacon, Benjamin Franklin, and, uh, of course, in particularly extended fashion, the writings of Adam Smith and his discussion, of course, of the division of labor, skill, and efficiency, and closely followed by writers like Charles Babbage and, and of course, Karl Marx and, in fact, others. By the early 1900s, Frederick Winslow Taylor, I would argue a much misunderstood figure, um, and his approach to productivity, efficiency, and control, likewise forefronted special attention to training, work skill, and a, a version, at least, of an educated role of work design. Indeed, Taylor demonstrated, if you look carefully at his writings, um, a much ignored understanding of the collective and, in fact, class, cultural, and communal basis uh, for virtually all work-related skill in the broadest sense. It was, of course, a mode of skill production he needed to understand if his system uh, was to effectively appropriate it. The first half of the 20th century uh, saw work design with these and other related ideas in mind developed and applied throughout the world, whether it was by the common mechanical engineer, a profession that was, uh, was relatively young at that time, the common shop floor manager, or office manager swept up by at that time, let us not forget the powerful technocratic social movement of the early 20th century. Um, and of course, and this is probably more so as much as I can gather uh, from readings, uh, this was a period more so than even today that was the time of the consultant. We think of today as the time of the, of the work design, technological consultant. That, looking back at history, the turn of the 20th century was definitely an age of the consultant. Uh, work consultants, of course, Taylor, Gantt, the Gilbreths in North America, uh, Badeau and Le Chatelier in Europe, Kanda and Uno in Japan, these are all famous figures. Gastev in Soviet Russia were all playing with versions of how work design related to skill, of course, with enormous implications. Gastev uh, working um, a little more creatively up until the late 20s. Um, all over the industrialized world, emphasis was being placed on not only the enormous gains to be made through attention to forms of work knowledge and skill, but of course the need to direct and control them effectively that in turn brought new and ever elaborated forms of ongoing conflict, a central theme in our field. Work-based skill and knowledge, its power, what it was truly worth, what employers were willing to pay for it, and what workers wanted to earn from it, can be seen as, as one of the, if not the, center points of both the daily grind, our everyday work lives, and the dramatic transformation that defined and bound economies and society together then and since. These broader early orientations uh, to the development and need for a science of work, skill, and by extension learning aside, what is more likely more difficult to dispute is the fact that the post-World War II era, uh, I guess the same time as that room was being put together in the 50s, somewhere in this building, uh, the World War II era ushered in 
an additional level of focus in the area of workplace skill and knowledge capacity. In the eight, if the 18th and 19th century was the infancy of thinking in this regard, its adolescence clearly began to emerge in the 1950s. Indeed, the discourse of what became known as the post-industrial thesis that flourished in research as well as policy circles in the late 50s and early 60s, still today arguably, uh, some this up in many ways. Here, skill, knowledge, and education eventually expressed in the still frequently cited works of Gary Becker's human capital theory became a touchstone for Western thinking. It was also at this time that the likes of Peter Drucker, Daniel Bell, and others produced the early odes to what we uh, now refer to commonly as the knowledge economy or knowledge intensive economy. At least three major forms of critical response were not far behind these proclamations of the post-industrial society or the knowledge economy. On the one hand, there was the theoretical work of Harry Braverman, his incredibly influential labor, monopoly, labor and monopoly cap capitalism, the degradation of work in the 20th century, the massive response it garnered across different sides of the ocean. Um, it targeted the meaning of skill as an object of struggle. And on the other hand, there was the research and policy work as well as the organizing uh, in the social democratic tradition, socialist tradition of the quality of work life movement rooted in Northern Europe notably Sweden, but elsewhere as well. And finally, there were the forms of everyday resistance that both organized and unorganized employees put up to claim their own view of the role of work, skill, and learning in their lives. Each offered an alternative to the post-industrialism thesis and the framing of the knowledge economy by mainstream thought. If these broad connections seem like uh, an overreach, too much of a reach to you, you say to yourself, Sachik, uh, you know, what are these folks really talking about, you know, our field? Then one point I'll remind you of is this. One point that partially answers that question. And it's worth recalling that our field is tasked and in some way burdened by a phenomenon so fundamental, so rich, and so complex, and so definitive of human society that we have little recourse but to see our knowledge of it as perpetually partial a forever receding horizon that can be constantly pursued and never solved. I'm speaking here, of course, of the phenomenon of learning itself. It's in the title of our field. It's in the title of conferences like this. Uh, for those seeking accounts of learning, especially accounts of learning where it's not named as learning, uh, they focus the lens just so, and they can actually find it in really any form of strong human science that they care to look. It's in good history, it's in good economics, it's in good, philo yes, it's in good economics, Bruce. It's in good philosophy, it's in good sociology, anthropology, and on and on. Any one of us could literally spend a career simply interpreting this scholarship through the lenses, the multiple lenses of workplace learning as we've developed them over the years. If that prospect is either depressing or exciting to you, I find it exciting. Uh, but in any case, in so many ways, workplace learning is a proxy for human change. Um, and it's for this reason that it does have the kind of historical reach, in my mind, uh, that I'm suggesting. Across the last 25 years, we can ask ourselves, is this richness and this complexity of learning, uh, has it really been translated into our field? And most of you, I would venture to say, every one of you here knows that it has. We have seen an accelerated expansion of conceptualizations, dissections, and even vivisections of, uh, of increasing numbers of dimensions and features of forms of workplace learning. Beyond the growing multidisciplinary voices more present than ever in this field, the literature has seen a course of proliferation, first of skill and knowledge types. We could go on a long time just listing, <coughs> listing these types from basic notions of soft or hard skills, uh, but to more analytically uh, useful or policy useful terms like general and vocationally specific skills, literacy, communication, comprehension, computer multitasking skills, on and on. And the proliferation doesn't stop there in terms of skill types. Distinct conceptualizations of workplace learning processes have also proliferated. Again, as virtually every one of you here will know, it's now common currency uh, to recognize not simply formal taught or self-taught learning, but the processes also include informal and tacit dimensions, planned and unplanned dimensions, experiential, incidental, and reflective dimensions amidst forms of legitimate peripheral participation, activity systems, actor network relations, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
In turn, debate encompassed in ever-increasing circles, not simply individual cognition, of course, but emotion, biography, identity, subjectivity, meaning, power, resistance, as well as relations of legitimacy. Again, how can we be expected to come to grips with such diversity if that is we think we need to try to do so in the first place? In this regard, for my own part, I have never been particularly comfortable with the distinctions that some researchers use between as tools to kind of sort out this terrible or wonderful complexity of the field, a tool to sort it out by referring to perspectives of either managerialist or critical perspectives. It's very common in our field. You've probably encountered it yourself at one point or another. I've actually used it in earlier days. Um, uh, the fact is, however, research is likely, all, good research is likely always critical of something. Maybe not the things I or you are critical of, but they are probing, testing, and challenging one thing or another. In light of this, I've come to, a much, come to be much more comfortable with the tradition of seeking to understand the field, as another subset of researchers has done, through themes. What are the dominant themes? What themes are missing or disproportionately represented? Uh, perhaps most importantly and subjectively, how well are such themes explored and by whom? There are a, a relatively small range of examples that have attempted to summarize the themes that define the field of workplace learning. Fewer still, in my mind, are the examples that seem to do it pretty well. A key example, though, in the past five or six years uh, is found across what I think of as invaluable contributions, contributions I go back to kind of again and again to check up on. Uh, and those are by uh, a scholar named Tara Fenwick. Uh, her review of, of research, she's done a series of articles, in fact, of this type, um, of several of the themes of workplace learning as well as the relations between individual and collective dimensions of workplace learning is incredibly instructive. Based on careful review of, albeit English language journals in our field, uh, for example, F Fenwick shows the persistent ambiguities in terms of learning as outcome, process, or as experience concluding in part that, and I'm quoting here from a 2006 publication of hers, she says, researchers' understanding of workplace learning may have become so complex and contested that it is difficult to state precisely what is meant by the term. Without better conceptual clarity, different researchers claiming to examine learning and its relationship with various contexts of work may be studying phenomena wholly different in kind and generating mutual confusion rather than enrichment. She goes on to reveal a, a number of trends in the field by looking carefully at citation levels um, and the topics that are covered by various articles. She shows a continuing orientation, something that is counterintuitive to some of us, I think, but a continuing orientation, according to citation records, to uh, forms of individualized modes of analysis. Um, lifting from her work, we know that uh, that approximately two-thirds of all the articles published maintain one form or another of individual orientation to you know, questioning, solving, researching, so on and so forth. Um, but just as important as the findings she's made in this area, um, what becomes clear that she doesn't necessarily address, but it's, it does become clear in reading uh, the work, is that the different subfields that constitute workplace learning study appear to retain a tendency towards self-referentialism. Uh, they're siloed, uh, producing what we could call a kind of a balkanization effect, separate islands, um, and discrete research dialogues, leading to frequent calls for research in areas that are already well undertaken by others. Who among us isn't guilty of this? I know I have been. It hinges on time and, and our audience, and sometimes the difficulty of negotiating uh, fundamentally different political commitments between pieces of work and, uh, and, and researchers. My point here simply uh, is to encourage pause in this regard, though, and to register the tendency, given the enormous intellectual riches to be mined when we challenge this tendency in even the slightest or most idiosyncratic of ways. For my own part, I have recently gone through the exercise of having to develop a, a kind of an overview conceptual criticism, which is why I was able to accept a, a kind of an invitation uh, from Henning uh, on short notice. Uh, it was actually for a much needed handbook project being led by uh, uh, Margaret Malick and Len Carnes and Karen Evans uh, and Bridget O'Connor. Uh, but it became clear to me in going through this um, that there do exist several key themes that can at least initiate an argument between and across these kind of balkanized groups. Uh, 
hope, be something more than an argument. Uh, central to identifying these was combining citation levels, which is typical in overviews, with the sticky, the very sticky business of identifying the most robust lines of research inquiry. This is the subjective part, uh, both of which, though, I, I think are essential for defining the field. What do I mean by robust in this context? By robust lines of inquiry, I mean researchers' programs that display the capacity to, to articulate more whole rather than less whole models of work and learning. It's clear in this regard that these research programs generate a, a sense of, of reach and depth through this. Mm. This is not to generate, not to, 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 to seek to advocate for the resurrection of grand narratives, uh, per se. Um, though such judgments of robustness are not easy to make, it does seem clear that programs of research, uh, there are some amongst them that do a better job at this than others. It's a little like, I wrote a note to myself, a little bit like driving through a fog bank in your car. It's difficult to say precisely when you've entered it or left it, but you know uh, when you're in a fog bank. And it's the same thing with good research. You know when you're engaging a text, and you know there's something good going on in it. So the achievement of a more whole account of workplace learning, what does it mean? For starters, it would typically mean an orientation to broader theoretical positions on the nature of the individual, the social, and minimally the institutions of work and economy, but also likely community as well as a fundamental basis uh, for the supply of, of skill in the very least. It should go without saying, though it won't, uh, carefully constructed empirical efforts are also necessary, but these empirical efforts should be oriented to describing and testing dynamic conditions. Indeed, robust research programs virtually always offer a challenge to mechanistic review, uh, views of reality. That is, phenomena such as cooperation and conflict, human agency and freedom, as well as determinations, patterns and structures are each fundamental to reality, yet only robust lines of inquiry and workplace learning uh, tend to clearly articulate these in a consistent basis. They also uh, recognize both subjective and objective nature of human practices, and by doing this, they give a sense of clear epistemological and even ontological positions. And finally, in some ways, most importantly, the most robust research can be, can be sussed out by, by noting that they virtually always recognize the inherent value-laden or political nature of both the research process, but also the phenomena it seeks to illuminate. Open from interpretation, amendment, revision, these, I would argue, are the minimal features of robust research in the field of workplace learning that would uh, be required to accompany a, an attempt at overview of the field. With, with such factors in mind, <coughs> in going through the literature, it did seem to me that there were at least six uh, major themes evident. I doubt that uh, more than one or two of these will be news to anyone here, but I, I think one or two of them will be news, I don't know which ones, to everyone here. Not news, but they will not have a working knowledge of them, let's say. Um, because I would add that I've yet, and combing through it pretty carefully, uh, I've yet to come across anyone who seems to generate a, familiar, a working familiarity with all six themes in any depth. Now, um, though vexing, uh, is the fact that despite their thematic focus, the most robust lines of research inquiry actually reach beyond themselves regularly and suggest points of contact with many of the other themes I'll mention. Sometimes they deal and, and, and touch on different topics beyond workplace learning, and occasionally they even come in contact with other disciplines altogether. Uh, indeed, weaker research is easily categorized and referenced. It tends to stay in one place and, and be pigeonholed. Robust research does not. I actually have a quote here from Maya Angelou. It says, well, you can never go home again. You can never leave it either, so that's all right. Maya Angelou, the poet. I have a little bit more of a cynical nature, so I also found another quote on the fact that researchers actually have homes, that even though they reach out and deal with other uh, themes, other researchers, so on and so forth, they always have a kind of a home base. I think that can be uh, seen in their work. Um, and so another quote on the home, I would say, is home is where you can say anything you like because no one listens to you anyways. <laughs> whatever, that, whatever the case, I'm, I'm actually at the point where I can talk about these six major thematic areas of workplace learning. And I want people, some of you anyways, to take a deep breath because not all of you will be mentioned. 
But if you look to your left and to your right, you'll find that there's probably someone as smart as you who wasn't mentioned either. So it's okay. Actually, be glad you're not mentioned because I'm probably mischaracterizing your work anyways. The first of the six theme areas of workplace learning remains, uh, in many ways, uh, the most dominant, at least if we're, if we're to go by citation records. It's a theme that I've entitled uh, Expertise, Judgment, and the Individual. Um, beginning with a recognizably traditional line of cognitive analysis, which is, you know, as we've seen, uh, quite central to our field, um, I, I think of first the complementarities and the interesting tensions uh, that emerge across the work of people like Michael Erott on the one hand and the work of Hager and Beckett on the other. Each in its own way has progressively filled up either the categories of cognitivist processing in relationship to work learning um, or on the other, the development of integrated competencies, uh, the phrenesis uh, and professional judgment. As robust research programs do each reaching out uh, and relating to findings and several other, other of the themes I'll mention below. But as I say, I, I would argue that there is a home to some of their work and that the home can be described, in my words, uh, by, this, by this term, expertise, judgment, and indiv individual, a major theme in our field. The second theme um, emerges because, of course, there's other ways to understand cognition and expertise. Um, and thus, a second theme uh, is something I've entitled microinteraction, cognition, and communication. It's actually perhaps the most siloed off or separated field. It's one that most of us don't come in a great deal of contact with. Um, and I think of first in this area, names like uh, Bruno Latour, Lucy Suchman, the original work of Harold Garfinkel on workplace studies, which was extensive, Harold Garfinkel being the father of ethnomethodology, a, a kind of a, a micro-interactionist approach. Um, here again is an example of a field of study that doesn't name uh, the term learning as such, but there's enormous uh, learning to be done from this scholarship in this, in this area. Each in their own way demonstrates the micro-mechanics of how communication and cognition is achieved on an everyday basis. Orienting more than any of the six other themes to naturalistic strips of fine grain interaction analysis. The third theme will be familiar to the most of you. Uh, I'm familiar with it because I guess this is where I'd place myself, but I refer to it with the title of mediated praxis and participation. Unlike most of the other themes, this one is perhaps the foremost challenger to traditional individual cognitive approaches. Most of you will know that. Some researchers in this theme uh, discuss it as such. Here I first think of the enormously influential works of Stephen Billet, of course, who I think you'll hear from at this conference, uh, Euro Engstrom, Lavenbanger, uh, Fuller and Unwin and her extended team of colleagues, David Guile and others as a whole. It's the centering of the individual in some cases, the criticism, of course, is its marginalization of the individual, has over the years today established the importance of social relations, participatory structures, artifacts, mediation, and context. The fourth theme, um, like the others, uh, is, is an enormous umbrella. It gathers under it uh, a, a great diversity of approaches. I titled it Meaning, Subjectivity, Identity, and Organizational Life. And here I think first of what I'm increasingly thinking of as the master works, if you will, of, of Sylvia Gerardi. She was actually a keynote, I think, at one of our conferences, probably where I first heard of her, um, which gives a particularly clear sense of this theme generally in my view, although likewise does the work of Nikki Solomon, uh, Tara Fenwick, uh, Leslie Farrell, Karen Evans, and, uh, and in a very different way, uh, handing uh, my little gargoyle here on the side of the stage. Uh, and his distinctive approach to critical theory, of course, uh, and subjectivity and uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, if cognition lays out important mechanics of information processing and schema, develop and schema development, something which simply can't be ignored, I mean, we can try to ignore it, but it affects our research, um, and participatory approaches match it with attention to social structures endemic to such development, this fourth theme, of meaning, subjectivity, identity, and organizational life clearly announces a place for multiple and often hierarchical meanings uh, that are made for individuals in relationship to such processes. Uh, much more, the last two themes, much more than the first four, these last two themes deal most consistently with matters related to the structure of work and economy. 
but they do so in fundamentally different ways, maybe even opposing ways. Uh, likely opposing ways. Uh, actually, they are opposing ways. I refer to the fifth theme as focusing on authority, control, and conflict. I begin here with the work of uh, my colleague D.W. Livingston, which has maintained a consistent view that control and conflict were central to under are central to understanding workplace learning under capitalism. This view is complemented, however, um, in turn by a whole host of workplace learning researchers who, are, who come from a labor perspective, labor educators, so on and so forth. Um, and here, people like Linda Cooper, a uh, former chair of our conference series, Keith Forrester, another former chair, uh, Lars Holmstrand here at the conference, I believe, Tony Brown, and a host of others uh, do excellent work from this labor perspective. The final thing was new to me when I first went on to try to develop a sense of what the major themes of this field were. But I'm, I'm becoming, oh, I won't say enchanted by it, but I'm becoming very, very interested by it. It's the theme that I entitled Competitiveness, Leadership, and Knowledge Management which takes matters of organization and firm strategy seriously from a very different vantage point from the previous theme. Uh, here I begin, I begin my reading with a combined uh, kind of place and tension uh, type of approach uh, to two types of scholars. Uh, one, the organizational development scholar named Joe Raylan, an American. Uh, I don't believe Joe's here. Um, the work of Len Cairns on leadership and paired them with the work of Ikejiro Nanaka. People not familiar with his work uh, may be blown away, I was, by the fact that uh, not only is it a seminal source for understanding the, the attempts at knowledge management, but he has produced wildly, wildly expansive conceptualizations of workplace learning without uh, apparently any knowledge of our field. Um, it, it is remarkable work to read though. Um, here are the basic contingencies of life under competitive markets, the need to learn faster than one's competitors, and how employees are best uh, included in such realities adds an additional set of observations actually not dealt with in any other themes. Nanaka, for example, clearly faces up to the contradiction, the perhaps even impossibilities of knowledge management. While Raylan's analysis takes, an enormous range, takes in an enormous range of workplace learning scholarship, uh, in fact, bridging most of the themes, unlike an unusual scholar to say the least, bridging so many of the themes I've just mentioned to chart an active as well as an applied role for employees uh, in the context of, of organizational needs. Of course, as I began stating, uh, one is on a very slippery slope uh, indeed when attempting to pigeonhole or describe robust programs of research. I'm almost afraid to finish my talk because I'll have to face some of them. Uh, but what defines them as robust it's difficult to pigeonhole them because what defines them as robust is the same thing that allows them to define easy categorization. Uh, so searching out robust programs of research make it difficult to categorize. Despite disagreements we might each have with this or that piece of work I've identified, what becomes clear in reviewing such research is that absolutely no one theme has a stranglehold on the multiplicity and complexity of the phenomenon of workplace learning. And for people, at least like me, this is a source of vitality and intellectual excitement. I'm going to conclude just briefly with, with, because this type of summary report uh, kind of feels like it compels me to do so, to make some remarks um, about the Royal Conference. Just three or four, five, six. Six of us. Okay. Well, then you won't remember this. But I guess you'll take it from me that it was ambitiously subtitled a first international conference. That was a subtitle. Researching, work, and learning, colon, first, at, first international conference. Ambitious because the organization, organizers had absolutely no intentions of doing another conference. That's true. And more than that, they had no one in mind to pick up where they left off. It was the brainchild of Dick Taylor, Kevin Ward, Keith Forrester, and a group of others at the University of Leeds Schooling of Continuing Education in the 1990s, a group that, for people like me, uh, far off in, the colon in its colony, Canada, uh, held an important place as one of the long-standing international homes of critical adult education. It's a testament to their foresight that they envisioned a need for such a conference series in the first place. It was not widely seen as it is today that there are conferences on a regular basis on work and learning. They structured the conference in such a way as to attract a set of scholarly conversations that were very broad. 
They also set and train an important tradition of attracting both theoretically minded and practice-based approaches to inquiry. Thus, from Leeds, England, to Calgary, Canada,